Chapter 22. No, Elena exclaimed. I'm not leaving Javi. She glared at me. She knew what I was thinking. Elena's face was diesel streaked. Her short hair stuck out from her head in uneven, greasy spikes. Her boy clothes hung torn and filthy from her skinny body. She put her dirty right index finger to her mouth and chewed at what was left of the nail. The chances of me changing her mind were zero. She wouldn't ha leave Javier, not after the train gang. I'm going to see if I can find us some water, I announced. I needed to get away. I needed to be alone, to think. I grabbed Javi's water bottle and headed away from the little clearing toward a trail that disappeared into the forest. Thousands of birds sang and called in the forest canopy above my head. The first natural sounds I had heard since the roar of the Matahente had filled my ears. I finally found a small but swiftly moving stream. I filled the water bottle, drank deeply, filled it again, then collapsed on the pebbled bank. What else could we do to get the rest of the way north? Try to find work? Ha! Doing what? Who would hire a couple of dirty teenagers or an old man anyway? I couldn't get work even in San Jacinto, where everyone knew me. If we had to, we could beg. Yes, there was always begging. I tried to picture myself with my hand out or knocking on a stranger's door, eyes down, hunched over to look smaller. Even so, the most we could hope for from begging was a little food. Nobody around here had money to hand out. No hopping back on the Matahente was our only real choice. I trudged toward the clearing, one slow step at a time. How could I ta talk some sense into Elena? But before I broke through the brush, I heard the voices of strangers. The soldiers had not given up after all. They had found us. I crouched and peered through the branches. At first, all I could see was what seemed to be the back end of a burrow and a pair of gnarled, bared feet. I inched closer. These were no soldiers. I pushed my way back through the thicket and stood next to Elena. In her hands was her little cloth bag. This time it had been cut open with Javi's knife. An old Indian man nodded slowly and tucked some of Elena's pesos away under his shirt. An old Indian woman, her silver braids swinging behind her, reached into a pack tied to the burrow, took out a package, and handed it to Javi. Without a word, they walked slowly away. We have a ride, Javi announced. Their Spanish isn't so good, but we managed. A primo drives a truck. He's going north tomorrow, and he'll let us ride in the back. How could you do this without talking to me first? We need every peso. You know that. How could you? I demanded. I knew you'd say no. Besides, it's the only way we'll make it. Elena stuck out her chin and crossed her arms. I grabbed Elena's elbow and dragged her to the far side of the clearing. No, Elena, I answered through clenched teeth. It's the only way he'll make it. It's the only way Javier will make it. I stared at Javi. He started to open the packet of food. He tugged at the string around the package. He didn't look at Elena or me. He's just using us, Elena. No lo puedes ver? Esta ciega? He's only thinking about what's best for him. He needs a ride. We don't. Elena probably thought she was being loyal, but Javi would leave us if he had to. Wouldn't he? Wouldn't he do whatever he had to do so he could make it for his family? Isn't that what a real father would do? Put his own family first? Elena was just too young to understand. You just couldn't stand it, Miguel. You can't stand to have me be right. You're so used to Ab Abuelita just thinking you're so great that you can do no wrong. The money was mine anyway. It was mine. Yours got stolen by Colmillo, remember? Cayete, Elena. Why don't you see the truth for a change? I snapped back. Elena did not back down. She looked me straight in the eye, just the way she looked at the goat before she hit it right in the head. 
Or better yet, ask him what to do. I pointed at Hobby. You seem to think he has all the answers. Well, ask him how he, how we get a coyote with no money. Ask him how we're going to get across the border. I have to ask Javi, don't I? He saved us from Morales, didn't he? You didn't know how to get us on the Mata Gente or about the train gangs. At least he got us a ride all the way to the border. You didn't know anything. You didn't do anything. Elena moved up closer. She was small, but she stood toe to toe with me. I used to lie awake in San Jacinto and pretend that Mama and Papa came home to get us, Elena went on, her voice quiet but fierce. Sometimes I even pretended they came home to stay. When I finally gave up on that, I pretended that you would take me across La Lina, that you would be the one, Miguel. You. I thought I could count on you. Grow up, Elena. Neither of us had moved. Guess what? You want to hear something? Don Clemente told me he, he'd he have sent us years ago to Papa and Mama, but Papa would not hear of it. He would not take a peso, not even for us. Elena stepped back. She looked like I had hit her full on, right in the mouth. You had to read Mama's letters instead of having her there, right there in front of you, all because of Papa's stupid pride. Do you get it, Elena? We never needed to wait. You never needed to pretend anything. She had hurt me as much as she could. I had hurt her just as bad because I could, because I was tired of her, of Javi, of everything, because I was tired of carrying the big load Don Clemente had dumped on me about Papa. I turned away from my sister and picked up my backpack. Elena did not think she needed me. Any idea I had about us being a team had vanished. Chapter 23 I don't believe you, Miguel. You're just saying that about Papa just to make me feel bad. Elena, Elena moved again in front of me. Mama wouldn't have let that happen. She would not have. Elena spoke to herself then, not to me, as if she was trying to convince herself it was true. Mama was her savior, just as I had always thought Papa was mine. Believe what you want and do what you want, Elena, I finally said. You always do anyway. I could give in to Javi and Elena's plan. It was two against one. She looked up to Javi. She trusted him, like a tío, an uncle, or godfather, maybe even a father. All we had left now was part of Juanito's money. Javi would probably find a reason to use the rest of it up, and Elena would just go along with him. Well, not me. I began to walk away, back into the forest. Go with Javi. I'm hopping back on the train. Tomorrow, if I can. Maybe I will see you at the border or California. Elena's face fell. Miguel, I didn't mean... She began. I cut her off. If you change your mind, I will be camped close to the train tracks. I found my way back to the stream. I bent and started to wash the first layer of diesel stink and grime from the train off my body. I used the small pebbles from the bottom of the stream to scrub my skin. I smelled my hands and wrinkled my nose. I stunk. Even if I had soap, I couldn't get rid of the mata gente. It had gone too deep to a place nothing could clean. I tried to see my reflection in a small pool at the edge of the stream, but a breeze sent a series of ripples across the surface. My eyes looked crossed, and my nose ran into my mouth. My face looked like a dozen different puzzle pieces. No matter which way I moved my head, the pieces would not fit together. If I ever made it across La Lina, I probably would not even know myself. After dark, I pushed my way through the cornfield until I came to the rocky railroad bed. I found a grassy spot off to the side and laid down, but sleep would not come. So I sat up, my back against a stump, and stared out at the tracks. Every bad part of riding the Mata Gente came back to me. 
I did not want to get back on the train. I hated the Mata Gente, but it was free and it headed in the right direction. I'd be alone, just like I was when I first started the trip. Solo, all alone. I moved my hand slowly to Abuelita's medallion, out of habit now to be sure it was still there. I made little circles with my right index finger on the smooth metal back. I made the circles again and again, non-stop, until I could not tell where my finger left off and the medallion began. I dozed, off and on, then late, very late, I sensed something near. The train gangs again? Soldiers? Other migrants like me? A dog or a wild cat? I did not move. Straining to hear, I got ready to run or hide. Something behind me rustled, ever so slightly. I turned slowly. There was Elena, peering out from the edge of the cornfield. Her black eyes shone like a wild animal watching and waiting. The tears running down her face, reflected by the light of the full moon, gave her away. Had she come to say goodbye? Had she come to say she was sorry? Was she thinking of coming with me after all? Did she finally realize that we would be better off without Javi? I didn't move. I was afraid I would startle Elena, that she would bolt like a deer. I wanted one more chance to convince her I was right. I opened my mouth to speak, to just whisper, Elena, to coax her closer. But before I could say it, Elena's face melted away and she was gone without a sound. The night was still. If Elena was walking back through the corn, she was as quiet as a ghost. Maybe I had imagined her, or maybe she really had come. I didn't know what was real anymore. Should I follow Elena? Should I go now, drag her back with me, make her get on the train? Would she do what I said anyway? Elena, my sister, me and Romana, who knew what was the right thing to do? Sure, Javier might look after Elena, but what if something happened to him? He already looked exhausted or sick. So what if I didn't know everything Javi knew? At least I was young and still strong. That had to count for something. What was our best chance of making it? Our best chance, I said to myself again and again. I realized I no longer thought about it as my trip north. I could not stand the thought of Elena going north alone. I could not stand the thought of me going alone either. And maybe it did not matter why I did it, but before the sun was up, I ran to the road as fast as I could. An old red truck belching black smoke was just pulling away. Esperen! Wait! I waved my arms wildly above my head. Wait for me! Elena's head popped up from the bed of the truck. A large, joyful smile spread across her face. Stop! she screamed. She banged with both fists on the rear window of the cab of the truck. You have to stop! Es Miguel! Mi hermano! My brother! The truck screeched to a halt. I ran to catch up and vaulted up over the back and into the truck bed. It was filled with burlap bags of coffee beans. The driver pointed to a large, bright blue tarp. If we knock on the window, put this over and hold still. We'll do our best, but if there's a checkpoint and they decide to check... Well, he didn't finish his sentence. There was only so much they could do. There was only so much we could expect. For two days and nights, the truck lumbered noisily down the roads, highways through towns. We drove around the edges of the big cities, traveling through a countryside that turned increasingly dry. Elena made me a nest out of the coffee bean bags with an extra one for a pillow. She made one for herself right next to mine. Once the second day, Javi caught my eye. He nodded silently as if to acknowledge something unsaid. It could have been a nod that said, I had made the right choice to not get back on the Mahatta Hente. Or maybe the nod was simply to say, Okay, here we are again. 
I couldn't tell, except for the nod, his face was blank. I stared out at the land and kept my thoughts to myself. The only thing that matters was making it across La Lina. If the stories were true, the worst was yet to come. Once we crossed La Lina, everything would change. Everything. Chapter 24. The border town was dust. It poofed up around our feet as we walked. The hoods of cars, window sills, a tattered blue awning above a closed shoe store, a single droopy mimosa tree next to the police station. Everything was clothed in sand. Elena wiped her hand across the dr trunk of a parked taxi, then wrote Lava May with her index finger. Bright green paint showed through, glinting in the sun. We walked toward the Mercado, where my contact could be found. Elena and Javier walked side by side. Javi limped slightly, favoring his right ankle. With each step, he leaned slightly toward Elena. She moved a little to the left, closing the gap between them. We crossed the street and pushed our way into the sidewalk on the other side. A crowd had gathered around the newsstand at the edge of the Mercado, or market. The headlines on three different newspapers screamed in giant letters. Se descarrila train. Cientos muertos. El mata gente, mata a muchos. Javi grabbed a paper and held it so Elena and I could see. The mata gente had derailed at a high speed, hours north of where we had jumped off. Many were killed, maybe hundreds. Many more were injured, and most were children. The photos were big and scary. Little bodies lay scattered like twigs across a grassy hill. Was it our mata gente, Javi? Elena asked. I don't know, Javi closed his eyes and took a deep breath. It could have been, or maybe the mata gente that came through the next day. Who knows? We read every word of every article in each of the papers, but they all said the same thing. Equipment failure. A tragedy. Children with no identification. A government investigation. Javi shook his head as if the news confirmed what he had already known. All I could think was that Elena and I had cheated death again. How much luck could we have left? We walked our way through the shoppers. Don Clemente's instructions said to look for a guy in the boot stall in the Mercado, I explained. There were the usual fruit and vegetable stores but there were others you'd find only at the border. One spot, El Coyote, sold supplies you needed to cross the desert. Knives, snake bite kits, light jackets and pants, a dozen kinds of hats and water bottles, hundreds and hundreds of blue and clear plastic water bottles. People crowded around looking through the items. An older man in a cowboy hat cradled an arm full of water bottles. Two teenage boys grabbed several pairs of pants with drawstrings. We need two pair each, one said to the other. They said it gets cold at night. Get one bigger pair to put on top and to protect against scorpions. A man and a woman in matching bright blue windbreakers stood off to the side of El Coyote. The words Socorro Fronterizo were stitched into the front of each jacket. They held thick stacks of pamphlets, handing one to every person who left the stall. An older woman took the paper politely, folded it, and put it in her shirt pocket. Si Dios es servido, llegamos, she said. She thought it was all in God's hands. Nothing the pamphlet said would make a difference to her. Two young men, about 20 years old, each took one. They scanned the pamphlet briefly, shrugged their shoulders, and threw them to the ground as they walked off. Another looked at the paper quizzically. 
He frowned at the words, but studied the drawings intently for seven minutes. Hoven, the man said. He pressed a pamphlet into my hand. His touch was warm and firm. Kind eyes met mine. Here, take one. Read it. Gaia de Seguridad en el Desierto. A survival guide for the desert. I glanced through the pages. Some of the advice was about desert safety, but most of it seemed to be about how to give yourself up or how to get back to Mexico if you were lost. Tip number three, if the border patrol intercepts you, keep your hands visible at all times. Never move them towards your pockets. Tip number seven, follow the power lines south. But the best thing is, don't go, the man cautioned. Go back home. It is very dangerous out there. He spoke to me as if I were the only one he would talk to all day, as if I was his son or brother or best friend. He must talk to hundreds a day the same way he talked to me. But I bet he did not convince more than one person a day to not try to cross. Gracias, I said. We just need one. We are together. I nodded toward Elena and Javi. A trail of warning pamphlets littered each of the pathways that led away from El Coyote's, ground into the dirt by the heels of border crossers in a hurry. Elena took the pamphlet out of my hand. At the far end of the Mercado, we found the one and only botas, or boots, stall. The scent of new leather filled the air. Some boots sat displayed on shelves in the back. Others hung from the ceiling out of reach. These were pointy-toed boots made of fine black, brown, tan, and white leather with lots of detail. These were boots for Misa, for baptisms, for weddings, quinceañeras, and funerals. A man sat in the middle of the stall on a short stool, hunched over a boot in his hands. He rubbed paste into the leather with his bare hands. He used a practiced circular movement. With each pass, the leather became softer and more pliable. We watched the man silently for several moments. He finally looked up, continuing to work the leather by touch. He was not young, but his face was as smooth and unwrinkled as the leather he held. A carefully trimmed mustache covered his upper lip. His green eyes moved slowly from me to Elena to Javi. What can I show you? He asked. I have a fine pair right there. They would be perfect for you. He spoke to Javier first, out of respect or practicality. Javi would be the only one with money. We're looking for El Plomero, I replied quickly, cutting off Javier. I wanted to be the first to talk. I make boots. If you need a plumber, I know a good one. He bent once again to his work. I wondered if there was a code or a password or secret sign that Don Clemente forgot to tell me. No, I insisted. I am sure. He told me to ask for El Plomero in the boot shop at the Mercado. I am sure that is what he said. The man's head came up again. He raised one eyebrow ever sl so slightly. Who told you? He asked. He continued to soften the leather. Don Clemente told me, I said. I was supposed to have been here days ago but I was delayed. What's your name? The man demanded. And what do you know about Don Clemente? He stopped his work now. I had his full attention. I didn't want to say much until I knew who this man was. I needed to know if he really was El Plumero or if he knew him. Most of all, I needed to know El Plumero's loyalty. Since Don Clemente's death, did he now work for Juanito? If he did, I could not trust him. My name is Miguel de Cervantes, 
Don Clemente arranged for El Plumero to help me. I didn't say the obvious, that El Plumero was to help me cross the border. I spoke to Don Clemente this morning. His eyes locked on mine. He did not blink. He said nothing about you, he continued. Your name means nothing to me. So he was El Plumero. That much was now clear, but what he said was a lie and a test for me. Don Clemente is dead. He died in an accident. Juanito told me so himself, I answered. And then I took a risk to see if I could trust the man or not. The most I would lose was this one coyote. There must be others, lots of others. Juanito either killed Don Clemente or had him killed, I declared. This thought had been forming in my mind for days, but it wasn't until I said it out loud that I knew it was the truth. The man's eyes flickered. He stood up and placed the boots on the counter. You can tell that to your grandchildren, but for now, keep it to yourself, he warned. Juanito is a worm the lowest of the low. He is trying to take over. I worked for Don Clemente for over 20 years. I will not work for anyone else. And yes, I am El Plumero. He examined us again. Is it the three of you then, or just you? The three of us, me, my sister Elena, Javier. I paused. Originally, it was just me, but El Plumero interrupted. No matter. Be here at three. I will have it all arranged. <laughs>